All right, welcome everyone. We are right at 10 o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, we are recording today's presentation, um, so this will be available later in case you want to watch it again or if you wanna share it with your friends. So bear with us, this is the first time we're doing something like this where we're doing a little bit of lecture and then a live component where we're actually going into our beehive today. Um, so as I already mentioned, for those of you who are signed on already, um, there are some instructions for how to use Zoom on the screen here. Um, please familiarize yourself with these. It'll be important for guiding us today and making sure we're all on the same page. Um, the main button you should be looking for is your Q&A box. This is where you are going to be able to type in questions and we'll be able to answer them here live. We may address those questions throughout the presentation and throughout our little tour of our hive here today. Or we may save some of the more intense questions till the end so we have more time to discuss them. As I mentioned already, we have the ability to raise your hand and ask to be unmuted. We will be saving that till the end to make sure that we have time to get through everything we are trying to cover today. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Again, if you have any questions right off the bat, feel free to put those in the Q&A. And today you are joining me for our virtual beehive tour, beehive tour with UFIFIS Extension in Seminole County. For those of you who do not know where we're located, because I know we have people joining us from all over today, uh, we are located not far from Orlando um, in the county north of Orlando, Seminole County, and not far from Disney for those of you who know where Disney is. So getting started today, I do want to talk to you about who we are before we get into the fun discussion on bees. Um, who are your presenters? So right now you are with me, Morgan Pinkerton. I am the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Agent in the county. And uh, I work a lot with our local farmers, including some of our local beekeepers, to help educate them on sustainable practices in their production. Um, we also have with us Katie McCormick, and um, she is the residential horticulture agent and master gardener, co gardener coordinator for us here in Seminole County. Uh, she has a really extensive background in horticulture as well as working with bees. And JK Yarborough, our livestock and natural resources agent here in Seminole County, and he also works in Orange County. He, as we'll learn today, works with bees because bees are actually livestock. We'll talk more about this later. And for those of you who are not familiar with Extension, though I know some of you may already be, what is Extension? Well, basically Extension is this partnership between a lot of organizations, including the federal, state, and local government, um, with the universities to communicate science to people in the community. Um, so our role as Extension agents is to bring that science that is going on at the universities and all of these scientists are putting a lot of hard work into and making sure that the people who are actually doing the work out in the field are using these cool new technologies that help make us more sustainable. That being said, it's a two way street. So with Extension, we are also translating what's going on at the level of the field and talking to the scientists about what the needs are and what kind of research needs to be done in the future to help better what's going on in the field. So we really have transformed. We have a lot, of, a lot more problems today than ever before and a growing population with the need to feed that growing population. So Extension is really critical in that role and we are addressing new challenges day by day. So with that, I'd like to get started in our discussion about bees. So today we are gonna be focusing mostly on the honeybee, but I just want to mention here that there are over 20,000 bee species in the world. So that is a lot of different kinds of bees. Sometimes we first think of bees as being the honeybees, but there are a lot of other ones out there. In the US, we have over 4,000 species alone. In Florida, about 315, and 29 of those are just found in Florida and nowhere else in the world. Um, so that's pretty cool. There's a lot of diversity, and you can see here that they don't all look the same. There's a lot of differences between them, um, but we will talk mainly today about one of the world's most famous bees, and that is the honeybee Aphis mellifera. 
So Apis mellifera is found all over the world. So it's found in all continents except Antarctica. So that is really incredible that we have the honeybee all over the world. And there's a lot of reasons as to why that is. Uh, one of the main ones is because it has economic significance as well as environmental importance all around the world too, which we'll talk a little bit more about here today. And for those of you who do know, bees also produce honey. So we like to keep bees for the production of honey as well as some other reasons, but honey is a really delicious um, snack that we all enjoy maybe in tea or using it for other purposes. But the bees are really that source of honey and we'll talk about honey production a little bit today as well. So what do our bees need to survive? And it's important to understand this, this basic concept so that we know what really goes on in the hive and why it happens the way it does. So just like we need food and we get a lot of different um, important things from our food, so do bees. And the bees need proteins, carbohydrates, fats, and other nutrients just like we do. Um, so what happens is the bees go out and collect nectar, pollen, as well as water, um, and that's how they get everything that they need to survive. So the nectar, that's really in our flowers, and we'll talk more about this later. Uh, nectar is the source of sugar, so those carbohydrates that the bees need to survive, and pollen provides a lot of proteins, fats, and some other nutrients that are also important to the bees' diet. And of course, water, just like you and I need water to survive, so do the bees. And they also use it for other purposes in the hive, from cooling the hive, temperature regulation, um, as well as needing it for survival. So when we go into our hive, in about 10 minutes here, we're going to go out to our hive. We are going to see some things, and let's look at the honeybee life cycle so we know what we're looking at when we're out there. And we're hoping to see all of these different stages today, but we'll take a look and see what's out there because the bees are continuing and doing their thing. Um, so to start off, the bees have a um, complete metamorphosis. So like some other insects, like butterflies, they undergo four life stages. And basically the queen will lay eggs and we'll start from those eggs. Um, the length of development here really depends on what the adult is going to end up being, which we'll talk more about here in a second. Um, so starting as eggs, they then hatch and become larvae, and those larvae will continue to eat and grow. For those first three days of the larva's life, the bees, um, that larva is eating all the same food, but at day three, um, that larva either gets a reduction in the diet they are using, or they keep eating that uh, rich royal jelly that is fed to the early larva. Um, and the ones that are continuing to eat that nice um, extra nutritious royal jelly will become queens. But this doesn't always happen. This only happens when the hive is ready to produce another queen and the uh, previous queen is about ready to leave. So for the most part, most of the workers are going to be eating a royal jelly diet and then for three days and then they get reduced to a lesser diet than that. Um, and they continue to eat, continue to eat until they are ready to pupate. And at that point, there is a cap put on to the cell so to make sure that that bee is protected during the time that she is pupating or he is pupating, as we'll learn later. Um, and after pupation, they emerge as adults. And like I mentioned before, that length of development changes depending on what they are going to emerge as. Um, so the three that we'll look at here, a bee's destiny is either going to be a drone, which is a male bee, a reproductive female or the queen, or a worker, which is a female bee. And most of our bees will end up being a worker. Um, though we'll see in our hive that it depends on what their destiny is, what the hive needs at that time as well. Um, so in terms of length of development, this queen will take about 16 days to develop because she is being fed a really extra rich diet compared to the others. And so she develops quicker. Um, the workers take about 21 days to develop and the drones will take about um, 24 days to develop. And within the hive, they all have a different role. 
uh, the workers do a lot of the hive maintenance. So feeding the young, taking care of the young, cleaning up the hive, as well as going to look for food sources. Um, so foraging and finding nectar and pollen sources and bringing those back to the hives as well. Um, the drones, their entire role is reproduction. Um, so they will go out and mate with queens from another hive. Um, so really, they don't do a whole lot within their hive themselves, um, except to be available for mating with nearby queens. The queen, our reproductive female, she is the powerhouse of the hive. Um, her pheromones or scents that she puts off are really important to directing the jobs in the hive, as well as her big major role of laying eggs. Um, so when a queen first emerges, she will go on what is called a mating flight to mate with drones from other hives, and then she is able to lay eggs. Um, our drones are actually unfertilized eggs, so um, they are males, the queen lays them without fertilizing them with sperm from the females, whereas our workers are a fertilized egg, and that kind of directs the development when the eggs are first laid. So I did have a question on the registration. Someone was curious about how we find the queen in the hive, and she looks different as we saw in this here that she's a little bit bigger, her abdomen is more elongated, um, and this again goes back to that initial diet. So her reproductive organs take up a lot of space in her abdomen, which is why she is bigger and more robust than the workers and the drones. But for those of you who are beekeepers, sometimes we will do what we call marking the queen, and we will put a queen safe paint, and that allows us to easily find her in the hive. It's usually some kind of bright color that stands against the yellow or brown colors in the hive, so that we can easily find her when she's moving around and we are inspecting our hives. And one more thing to mention here, I did have someone ask why there are different colors of these. Some of this goes down to what their role in the hive is. As you can see, there's a little bit of differences in colors here, but it really boils down to genetics. So the queen will mate with multiple males, multiple drone males. So that means she has a couple different genetics available to pull from when she is laying eggs. Um, so those genetics may be coming from different hives to begin with. And so that's why within a hive, you might see some variation in the colors of the workers, for example. So moving right along here about the structure of the hive, the workers basically will build that hive from beeswax and propolis. Um, so they form these hexagonal cells, and this is a very typical shape that you see with our beehives. And this is just because this is where they end up putting their young, this is how they store their honey. Um, and they also do this in a very organized manner. Um, bees have wax glands on their abdomen that helps them produce this wax. And then propolis is basically like a homemade glue that bees make from wax and resin from plants and trees. So one important thing that we all like to think about is how bees make and store honey because this is something delicious that we ourselves like to harvest and eat as well. So what really goes on in the hive to produce honey? So it starts with a forager. So one of our workers will go out and hunt for nectar. nectar. And nectar is in our flowers. We'll take a look at this here shortly too. Um, so they're taking nectar, which is like a sweet, sugary, watery substance from the flowers. And they put them, and when she takes this nectar, she's putting it in a special structure called um, a honey stomach. So this is different than the stomach that they use to eat food. Um, but in that honey stomach, there's special enzymes that help break down that, that sugar inside that nectar to simpler sugars. And so she takes that nectar, bringing it back to the hive, and then she'll probably pass it on to another worker. And that other worker will add some more enzymes into that in their honey stomach, break it down a little bit further, and once it's broken down to the state that is acceptable to the bees, um, they will put it in an area for storage. 
So when the bee that was out foraging took this nectar, it was about 80% water and only about 20% sugar. And so what will happen is the bees will kind of flap their wings and let the water evaporate off of that honey until it's the opposite, until it's about 80% sugar and 20% water. And once it's good to go and it's ready to be stored, it'll be capped, as you can see here. Um, and capped honey is just storage of food for when there is not food available out in the environment. So at this stage, the honey is extra sticky and it's ready to be sealed with a wax lid and stored for, fut for the future. And for later when the bees end up consuming it or when we end up harvesting some of it and consuming it ourselves. Why do we care so much about bees? Well, bees have very, very important roles in the environment. And the most critical one that we think of is pollination services. So this is in our natural lands as well as our agricultural lands. Um, so I'm, I specialize in agriculture, so I will mention some really cool stuff about this, that bees pollinate nearly $20 billion worth of US crops annually. So without bees, we would not have a lot of our crops. They pollinate things from almonds to avocados, apples, apricots, blackberries, blueberries, strawberries, watermelon, and many, many more. So I will take the example of almonds because thanks to our honeybees, almonds are here, basically. That's the best way of putting it. Uh, almond farmers actually will hire beekeepers to bring their bees from other parts of the US to pollinate their almond crops. And as you can see here, there are lots of flowers on these almond trees. Another really cool example that's relevant to here in Florida is watermelon production. So bees are very important in the pollination of watermelon and it takes about 24 honeybees to visit a single flower for that to turn into a successful watermelon as we know and enjoy watermelon. So bees are important to pollination, to being able to produce that fruit, but also making sure that it's the quality fruit that we know and enjoy as well. And like I said, they produce a lot. Um, bees help to produce a lot of our crops here in the US and throughout the world. And the other reason we care about bees, as we've already mentioned, is they have delicious honey that we also enjoy eating. So what is pollination? For those of you who may not know, we'll quickly review this. Pollination is basically a transfer of pollen from the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower. So some plants will do this by wind. So like here in Florida, we have pollen that likes to stick to our cars during springtime. And you see that nice coat of pollen. This is wind moving pollen to new areas. And the parent plant is basically hoping that that gets to another flower where it will pollinate and produce a fruit, produce a seed. And some of our plants do need help with this. So that's where our pollinators come in, like our honeybees, where the pollinators will pick up pollen when they're visiting flowers, and then when they go to visit another flower, they then transfer it. And so honeybees are really cool pollinators in that they have a special structure on their hind leg that is called a pollen basket. Um, so this helps them collect pollen to bring back to the hive, but then you can notice that there's also a lot of hairs all over the bee. So when this bee is visiting this flower, it's picking up pollen on all over its body so that the, the next flower it goes to visit, it puts some of that pollen onto the other flowers, then pollinating that flower, allowing it to be able to produce seeds, to produce fruit in the case of agriculture. And another cool thing with our bees is flower constancy. So they do have the tendency to visit the same species of flowers once they find one that they like. So this really helps our plants um, have a chance of getting that pollen to another plant of the same species, which is why we use honeybees in addition to being able to keep them in hives for our agricultural commodities. And before we go out into the hive, I do want to address the question, are bees dangerous? Um, so bees 
are not dangerous unless you threaten them. So the only time bees are going to end up stinging you is when they feel threatened, and some of them are trying to protect their hive, their home, just as we would if someone was trying to get into our homes. So the reason we use bee suits and we protect ourselves is just because the bees are going to be defensive. We're going into their home. But another thing that we can do to prevent protect ourselves is to use smoke. And we'll talk more about this when we get it outside into our hive today. Um, we use smoke to kind of disrupt their communication system. So bees communicate by pheromones, which is like the equivalent of a smell to us. And so we put that smoke out there, which is basically like a really, really strong smell that covers up the bees pheromones, the bees smells that they're making themselves. And so it blocks them from communicating with each other and from communicating specifically an alarm that there's something going on, that something's attacking the hive, which is what we don't want when we're in there inspecting our hives. So that smoke comes into important to protecting us as well as making sure the bees are staying calm while we're handling them. And what about bee stings? Well, it's only the female workers that have a stinger. So if you've ever seen someone pet a bee. This is something I've seen beekeepers do a lot. It's usually a drone that they are petting, so it's only our female workers that have that stinger. The drones do not, and they sting, as I mentioned, for protection to defend their hive. But once a bee stings, she is going to die because with that stinger it takes out a lot of her organs, and so she has done her job. She's tried to help protect the hive, and her life is over at that point. So with that, I am going to transition out into the hive. Um, so bear with us a few minutes. I know we do have some questions here in the chat and we will address these as we're working in the hive today. Um, but hold on for just a second and we're gonna move on to outside in the hive. Okay, we should be good to go here. Um, someone want to throw into the Q and A here if you can hear us, just to make sure. I'm gonna switch the camera over to facing you guys. Maybe there we go. All right, we're coming into our beehive here. Oh, maybe. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, yes, everyone can hear us. We're all good to go. All right, so here's like what we talked about. We have our smoker that we're just basically calming the bees down, letting them know that we are about to come in, about to open up the hive. Just go ahead or explain. Yeah, you can go ahead and start, JK. So okay. JK is going to start opening our hive. He has our hive tool here as well. So when we open it up, we always check the lid to make sure the queen's not on it if we don't have a queen excluder. Good. Yeah. Okay. And so this is, you all might know already, this is a super because it supersedes our brood box here. In this case, we're trying to make it into a honey super, but first we got to build comb. Um, so we're trying to get him to build some comb right now. As you can see, Katie and I are scraping off the propolis, which is that gooey resinous substance that they make to seal up their hive uh, to make it nice and airtight. But it's really sticky and gooey. So we're trying to get them to build some comb on these. Maybe we got a little bit in the middle. You got them stuck though, that's for sure. Pull one out to see what the kind of progress they're making on here. And so you can see we have here some white foundation that's in the middle of our frame. That's to give them some kind of a template to try to build some comb off of. And you can see in the middle there, we actually put a little bit of melted wax and they've drawn off of that and made a little bit of comb, but not too much. Oh, it looks like they're actually putting enough comb on that one to put some brood, which is okay. Because then about 21 days, well, actually they're sealed, so to give a bit, a bit shorter than that, sealed at about nine or eight days. So about uh, 11 days or so, 10 days, they'll emerge from there and the bees will clean it out and we can use it back for a honey super, honeycomb if we want to, what if we put a queen excluder on. But really, I just want these bees to start building comb on here first. So we'll probably let it go. And we're gonna go ahead and take this super off so we can see what's on the going on at the bottom in the brood chamber. Whenever you take supers off, uh, if in this instance, since we don't know where our queen is, when we take it off and set it down, we wanna set it down vertically. That way, uh, if the queen's in there, she can still, if she falls out, she just falls onto the bottom of the box. Uh, if you set it down, set it straight down, you know, she could fall down to the ground and you would never know, you know where your queen's at. So we wanna to try to make sure our queen stays in our box in case she's in there. Chances are she's in here. Though. Katie's making sure that we still got smoke going. Give them a couple puffs. Tend to keep them calm and make sure they know we're coming in. Again, that propolis really makes everything sticky in here. So you gotta really work. There we go. Here's a pretty basic frame. We got some cat brood in the middle there and some C-shaped pretty filled out larva in the back of some of them. And I'll show y'all better in a second. After I take a look, I'm looking for eggs to see if there's any eggs laid in these cells, but I don't see any in there right now look for, look for eggs what we do is we just kind of look in the backs of the combs at the very bottom down there you'll see a little bit of we can we, we liken it to a grain of rice just small little white fleck um, at the bottom and those eggs in about three days they'll become pupae and then they'll build into those c-shaped now this is a much better laying pattern we see here you can see some spaces and gaps in between that in between the combs there but all in all it's a pretty solid pattern especially for being an end frame that's pretty good Still don't see any eggs in there. We have one uncharacteristic drone brood in this one, actually. Uh, see if I can't get you to see it better. You can see how smooth all this cat brood is, but if you look right here, there's one big bump right there. 
and that big bump is going to be a, a drone brood. So that there may be inside there. Usually there's a group, a cluster of them together, but in this case, it, you know, she laid a drone brood right there. What do you got over there, Katie? Mostly empty on that side. Mostly empty. And mostly empty on this side. They've got a little bit of pollen, which are up in the top here. So they're storing a little bit of pollen in there, but this one is mostly cleaned out, which I think this one might have been brood that have hatched out recently. Hatched out recently, yeah, that's probably what it was. They do have a little nectar up in the corners over here too, which is where all they're all clustering right now. Yeah, and that nectar, what they're collecting from the, the blooms. Yeah, that's what they're collecting from the blooms, and that which what that is what will eventually become stored honey. It's, the nectar has to go through a process in which it's dehydrated honey has about between sixteen to eighteen percent moisture in it, so they're kind of dehydrating that uh, nectar, running it through a few couple of enzymes that the bees put in there as well, and then it will eventually become nice honey. Here we have more of a kind of spotty brood pattern, laying pattern again. Um, but again, it could just be that these ones have just recently emerged. And we will see what's on the back. That's a much better laying pattern, a little bit more solid. As you get to the middle of the hive, that's what you like to see is a more solid laying pattern. On the edges of the hive, it can be a little skimpy. Maybe put some more uh, nectar and honey resources on those ends. When we think about uh, a hive, we think of it kind of like a basketball uh, that's cut into slices, if you will, inside the box. And so as we get toward the middle, that basketball is going to be a little bit thicker. There we go. We've got some C shaped brood. So she laid a little while ago in here, and we've got the little larva growing up. Another single drone brood over here in the bottom. There's that drone brood down at the bottom. Katie's point. And this one does have eggs in it. So we got lots of questions coming in, but oh, okay. how do you tell a drone from a worker okay. from honey cells? Oh, cells? Yeah. So the cells are kind of going to be whatever. The bees can use them however they see fit. Now, usually drone cells are going to be a little bit larger in size because the drones themselves are larger in size. So they need a little bit more room to be able to grow. Um, but uh, everything else, the honey, honey cells, well, honeycomb, worker, drone brew, worker cells, it's all the same. They build them all the same and they use them for however they need, they see fit. We got another question here. How do you clean the smoker and how often do you do that? Mm -hmm. So smoker, the best thing to do really is after you get done with it, if you still got some in there, just puff it a bunch, get it real hot on the inside. And when you go to dump it all out, use your hive tool to scrape off some of that resin that builds up in the, in the uh, top section. Now on the bottom there, some ash may build up as well, but um, you can just dump that as it gets filled up really. The inside chamber really doesn't get too much material on it, depends on what you're burning and how hot you're burning it. Um, so I would, I would just check it every, every month or so, um, the inside chamber, but that top section, whenever you get done smoking it, I would just take your uh, hive tool and scrape off what you can on the inside. This one's full of, or full of bees here, just a bunch of bees really. Have a lot of pollen in it. Oh, okay. Let's take a look at all that pollen. Maybe we can see it if there's not bees on it. That pollen, that pollen's their source of protein for these bees, and so that's an important part when it comes to nutrition. The white the yellow cheese-like substance is actually pollen in those corners. Yeah, those nice colors in the cells. These guys are being really nice and quiet today. There so are. why are there different colors of pollen? Because plants have different colors of pollen. That's right. Different. We've been uh, seeing one recently that's been really interesting and I'm wondering what planet comes through from every once in a while, we'll see a bee in here with a uh, lime green pollen, pollen baskets. Yeah. 
So B activity. See a good number of bees. There's quite a bit of pollen on this one as well. Flip it over. Now you see we've been handling these ones pretty nilly willy like because they have foundation frames. Now if you have if you're using frames without foundation, you have to be kind of careful when you go to flip them because if you flip them out like this, gravity will take effect and just knock your comb right out the bottom, and then you have a mess. So you want to turn it on its sides when you have foundationless frames. Yeah, look like these. Got a couple of C shapes. See some eggs in this one as well in the back there. Oh, it'd be hard to see. Yeah, but... definitely with this yellow foundation, definitely kind of hard to see. You can see some clusters of bees here. They're likely they're doing the process where they're actually sharing that honey, most likely. So you got their, their tongues out and they're probably transferring honey from a forager bee to a honeymaker bee. These jobs change as they age. So whenever they're first born, a lot of their jobs are jobs that are done inside the hive. So taking care of the baby bees, uh, uh, making honey, taking care of the queen, maybe guarding the hive. And as they age, they actually become forager bees. And that's when they'll go outside and forage around for nectar and pollen. So I got another question coming in. When doing a routine hive inspection, what should you be looking for to ensure that the ongoing health is good? Yeah. So largely it's gonna depend on uh, what time of year it is. So during routine inspection, first you're just gonna check, do you see any eggs? Uh, you don't always have to look for your queen. You know, queen spotting can be difficult. I don't think we've seen her yet in this hive yet, but we're also not really looking real hard for her. Um, we've seen eggs. And so that's evidence that that queen has been here in the last three days. And so that's good enough for us. Um, you're also going to check for, if you're looking for health stuff, we're going to check for a K-wing situations. So situations where their wings may be um, separated. Bees actually have four wings, two pair. So you can kind of see on some of the, mm, a little bit on some of these bees, how they have their wings up in the air. Those are okay. But when the forewing and the rear wing uh, become separated, that's when we got issues going on. And that can be evidence of some uh, diseases being spread by varroa mites or other issues like that. Also look for just dead bees. If you have, so you have a lot of dead bees in the bottom, that's gonna be evidence of something wrong. Getting low on our smoke here. Kinda wanna smoke them down a little bit. So. How often should you inspect your hives too? That also depends on the time of year. So this time of year when it's swarm season, uh, you're going to want to check them. Yeah. You're going to want to check them. At, I like to see it at least once a week uh, during the swarm time of the year because it won't take them long to swarm on you uh, if you have a swarm situation. And the winter time, you can get away with once a month, really. And then in that summer to fall time, Whenever there's not such a strong nectar flow happening, you can get away with it once every two weeks. Ah, so here's one of those ones I had mentioned earlier about foundationless frame. So if you look at the bottom, you can see those gaps underneath all that underneath all that comb. It's because we don't have any foundation in this frame for them to try to build on. We didn't give them a template, so they just did their own thing. And when they do that, they usually make comb that's a little bit bigger. And so when they do that, it usually ends up being drone brood. And so blow some of these bees away real quick. And you can see those big bullet shaped uh, uh, brood going on in there. And that's what, exactly what that is. That's their drone brood, heavy drone brood. So remember I said, you gotta flip these ones kind of carefully. So you gotta turn, flip like that. And on the back we have, well, more, more drone brood. Oh, okay, has got a queen for us. Yeah, there she is, right in the middle. There we go. And that's our queen right there. You can see that in this hive, we don't have her marked. We don't, but we can. But we can go ahead and mark her. You have the marker still okay? I have the plunger system. Where's she at? All right, dude. I'm gonna try to get her and her alone in this. Oh, she knows the game. <laughs> I don't have my usual uh, clip. clip with me because it's actually being occupied by another queen. Oh, you dirty little queen. Here. So I got her pinched down here at the bottom. Oh, oh. sorry. 
There she is. Oh, there she God. goes. Oh, God. Eh. It's okay. No, we'll, we'll find her later. again another day when we get the clip. And you can actually grab the queen. The queen can sting. She actually has a stinger capability. Oh, I got stung here. Uh, but the thing that's unique about the queen is that she can actually sting multiple times. Whereas a lot of our worker bees, they can sting one time. Like this way, she just stung me. And, and she'll her stinger will come out and she'll go off and die. Because the queen, she doesn't have uh, sharp barbs. Got it? Take some ash. That's what we got right now. It's not working very good. Uh, the queen, her barbs are, she doesn't have barbs. Oh, yeah. She doesn't have barbs, so she can sting multiple times, but she doesn't sting very often. We had a question too. What here is this mason jar that we have on the side? Yeah, so that's our Boardman feeder. So like I mentioned earlier, I'm trying to get these bees to um, draw a comb for me. And to do so, I mean, that's, a, that's an energy intensive process. So to do that, you know, they got to have that source of energy. So we're actually feeding them some substitute uh, sugar water, essentially, to try to substitute for some nectar. Give them a little bit more energy, give them that more nutrition they need to be able to build that cone. So that's our feeder system. It's, it's empty right now. I need to put something in it. We feed in the summertime. Uh, you can feed a one-to-one uh, -one ratio of sugar to water by volume and just fill it up. We have holes and just poked in the top of our uh, uh, lid here. We just invert it and the vacuum takes place and kind of holds it in place. So there's just bubble or just drops down at the bottom. We just set it in there and the bees can come and get that water so or that energy source whenever they need it. All right. So I guess we're good to close this one up. We have lots of more questions coming in that oh, we can kind of answer. Bring them on. Um, we have someone said it's swarm time now. What is swarming? <laughs> uh, give me a second and I'll show you exactly what a swarm is. Well, so swarming is when we talk about beekeeping, we have to take, we have to try to change our mindset. We don't think about individual bees anymore when you become a beekeeper. You need to think about bee colonies. The hive itself is an actual, what we call super organism. And so it, it has characteristics that make it, it an organism all of it itself. And so when it comes time to swarm, one of those things that the, um, are we good to put this on? So one of the things that a super organism or any organism likes to do is reproduce and, and bee colony is no different. So it likes to reproduce. And so again, we're not talking about bees. We're not talking about a queen laying eggs. We're talking about this, the colony itself actually reproducing and becoming well, two different colonies. And when that happens is this time of the year, whenever the nectar flow is going on, there's a lot of energy sources out there, uh, the bees know it. So and sometimes also whenever there's a lot of reproduction going on, the hive gets real tight, a lot of bees, they'll know it's time to swarm. So it's time for them to produce a whole nother colony. So what happens is a lot of the bees will just engorge themselves on honey, get real big and fat, eat all the honey they can to get all their energy built up. They'll starve the queen so she's nice and thin. That way she actually is able to fly. And then they'll kick the queen out. And then about 50 to anywhere between 50 to 80% of the population in that hive will just leave. And uh, they'll take that queen and they'll go search for a new spot for a good hive. And they're essentially leaving some of those bees back here to reproduce. They'll also leave some queen cells, which are going to be baby queens that can hatch and become queens and go out and get mated and come back and lay as well. So it's essentially the hive becoming two hives. And we actually had that happen to us like 20 minutes before y'all came out here. As a matter of fact, that hive right there just swarmed on us. And so we actually were able to catch it out of this tree over here. So if you want, we, as we walk back to the uh, computers or whatever, we can actually take a look and see how that hive, that, that we, the swarm that we caught, See how they're doing. Right. Go walk over here where our swarm that we caught is located. And I had someone ask us where we are. We are at the UFI Fist Extension Seminole County office. So we're located in Sanford, Florida, just north of Orlando. So you can see our swarm we caught here. Uh, they were all up in this tree. I mean, they were pouring out of that hive in the moment we came out here and they got up into a couple of branches and the queen was up there and so the rest of the bees just swarm swarm around that queen and some scout bees go out and look for other places where it could be a good suitable source for a new hive and so katie and i we cut down the branches we shook out the branches to find the queen and then we actually found her inside the queen box because we set her in there first and so we took our clip and we clipped her so she's in there for sure we know it and a swarm wants to go around their queen so they're all gonna congregate up in this box. We're gonna put the lid on it and we're gonna let them sit in there for a few days. 
So that way they uh, get accustomed to that place, think of it as their new home, and then we'll let the queen out and then she can go back to laying eggs. It was pretty amazing. We shook them out on the tarp and almost immediately, as soon as we put the queen in the box, they started marching toward the box. Yep. Entrance. They knew exactly so where that queen, was. yeah, they knew exactly where that queen pheromone was. So they all started coming straight to the hive, to the box. So we'll put this lid on it uh, and then we'll put it back in there and let it sit for a few days. So yeah, we, we caught a swarm today. That was pretty fun. A little panicking because y'all are about to come out here soon. So we didn't know what we were going to do, but it worked out in the end. Yeah. And another question here, what do you do if you cannot find the queen? Well, you're gonna to wanna to look for signs that the queen is still there. As we talked about, if you can't find her, um, she might still be in there. Just look for egg production to see if she's been laying eggs recently. And also just look what's, what's going on else in the hive that could indicate that maybe she has left. Are there queen cells? And we didn't have any queen cells in this hive, thankfully, to show you. Yeah. But we can take a look at those when we move back inside to look at the computer. And um, someone had a question. They wanted to look at this sugar setup again. And just getting a close up of this, you can see there's just some holes poked in the lid here. Just a regular mason jar. And when you flip it over, that water will kind of be vacuumed in there. So it's a sugar water mixture as JK talked about already. And then the bees can visit it to get uh, that sugar water just as they would visit a flower and get nectar. Right. And what do you treat bee stings with? <laughs> so bee stings, there, there's no true real treatment treatment. So when it comes to bee stings, if you get stung, First thing to do is get the stinger out as quickly as possible. Uh, there's been some conception about if you just scrape it out because the stinger still has a venom pump attached to it that's pumping venom into you. So, so the old conception was you needed to, to scrape it out. That way you're not pushing or pinching that venom pump and injecting it into yourself more. We've done some research that's shown that the only difference, the, the real difference that you need to do is just to get it out as quickly as possible. It doesn't make, it, make, make a difference if you pull it out or scrape it out is get it out as quickly as possible. There's the big difference. So after that, uh, first you should already know if you're truly allergic or not. Only about 4% of the population is truly allergic to bee stings, which a lot of people think they are, but they're really not. Um, so after that, you know, you expect some swelling, expect a little bit of pain. Um, it'll dull down eventually. You might have a red spot. You might have a little bit of a brown spot where it stung you. Um, but in a few days, it'll go away. The only thing you can really do is take an antihistamine if, it, if you're acceptable to that but that's about the best way you can really treat a bee sting. If you are actually allergic to bee stings and have an allergic reaction where you're having trouble breathing, you should go to the doctor immediately. Um, and if you know you're allergic to bee stings and also still wanna be a beekeeper, you should definitely have your EpiPen uh, ready to go. Yeah. Um, when you are taking out the frames, do you always put them back in the same place that you found them? Uh, generally, yes, that's, that's the procedure. Only time you would kind of change that up is if you were trying to change what's going on with that frame. So sometimes we have some frames that they're not at the end, maybe they're not really building comb on. So we'll put those a little bit more towards the middle to give them a reason to try to draw more comb on it and flush out that frame. Here. All right. A um, couple more questions on here. Um, where do you get your bees from? Do you buy them? And how do you find a reputable source? So, yep, you, if for your beginner beekeeper, I would definitely recommend buying your bees uh, first. You can get bees in several different ways. You can get a package of bees, which is literally what it sounds like, a package of bees. You can get a, what we call a nuke, which is a small five frame, which where we had the swarm, you saw how that was a smaller box. That's kind of what we call a nuke or a nucleus colony. It starts off with just five frames until they build up. And there you can get a whole full frame, a full 10 frame size colony uh, ready to go as well. Uh, I would definitely recommend uh, getting either a nuke or a full frame for your starters and definitely recommend getting at least two if you're going to start off with. Uh, how do you make sure reputable buyers? Uh, you know, that's just a tough one. You know, look at their past experience, talk around, big time go check out your local beekeeping association or club and check out and see who they're buying from because chances are they've been in the trade for a while. So they have a good idea of who to buy from. There is the option of catching swarms like this or feral bees, but uh, you can do that as well, but you should really get that, do that maybe after you got 
some bees established first to give you some experience with it beforehand. How far will bees fly to find pollen and nectar? Uh, the research says that anywhere between the, range, the farthest range is about five to seven miles. But when they start going out that far, they're really not making, it's not energy efficient. They're spending as much energy as it takes for them to go out that far as they are bringing back in nectar. So they, that's the maximum range. So they can go out to five to seven. Lots of questions here. Um, let's see. Did you make the sugar water setup yourself or did you buy that pre -made? This one, well, I inherited this one whenever I took over the beekeeping program, honestly. So I, I can't say I built it myself. Um, I'm sure there are different templates. Actually, I know there are. So if you're into 3D printing, if you ever go to the website Thingiverse, where they have a lot of free 3D print templates out there, there's all sorts of bee feeding uh, and building uh, templates out there. Um, so you can try to build off of that or just get a blueprint offline. It's pretty simple. It's just a hollow hollow center with a, a cup on top, essentially, or, or a jar in this case. Um, so I can't say I built this one. Another question back to the swarming. Why would a hive start to swarm? Just to kind of clarify that. Mm -hmm. So again, that's the colony itself is reproducing. And so it knows it's time to reproduce whenever one springtime comes around and there's a lot of energy, a lot of energy sources, a lot of blooms going on. So the bees know that they can swarm and have enough energy all around them, energy sources to build a new hive. Also, whenever it starts to get real full inside the bee, inside the brood colony, if it starts to get real loaded, lots and lots of brood, too much bees going on, they can feel that pressure. So that's when they also will want to swarm. So it's just a natural thing that they want to do. It's just swarming is reproduction for them. And so it's just natural for them to desire to do that especially in the springtime, strongly coincides with the nectar flow. And a couple more questions talking back to the beekeeping and the hive. What happens if the wax foundation starts to fall off the frame? Is there a way to secure it back on? Your wax foundation? Yeah, if you've got, well, if you've got foundation of the frame, I think is what they're talking about. Well, it could be a wax foundation too, because so wax foundation, you can actually buy, you saw we have, plastic foundation in these, you can't actually get foundation that is beeswax to start off with. And that's usually attached by, there's wires running through it. So now you can buy it with wires attached and you got to get some wedged top for a top bar um, for your frames. And you put the wires in there and you knock, nail the wedge back in there to hold it tight. Um, in this case, which it probably is, is that if you have foundationless and you can build in comb on top of it, uh, you can take rubber bands. If it falls off, take rubber bands and rubber band it around the frame. It's that way it kind of presses that comb in that vertical position and holds it tight. Uh, and then the bees will try to reconnect them after that. Okay. And I know we have a couple more questions on here and we haven't addressed all of them, but we're going to take a quick pause to move back into the classroom. Um, this is because we have some questions that we have some slides to help address okay, some of these great. questions yeah. that are left. That's great. Miss Katie and I will be there to help as well. All right. So go ahead and bear with us here for a second as we stop video and then move inside. Alrighty, okay, so we do have quite a few questions here that kind of just relate to why bees are classified as livestock and some other things to do with 
how we can help protect the bees and how we can, as homeowners and people in the community, can help make sure that those bees are happy and healthy. All right, so JK and Katie will be joining me back here in a second, but in the meantime, let's do a little bit more talking um, about beekeepers in Florida. So someone asked a question in here, why are bees considered livestock? And well, the simplest way to answer that is because bees are, um, they, they need a lot of care. And for the purposes of agricultural classifications, they're also considered livestock. Um, and so it kind of just goes back to surrounding um, how bees are cared for and that they produce a product that we enjoy. Honey, just as you would produce cattle um, for, uh, for meat production or producing some cattle for milk production as well. So here in Florida, we do have a lot of beekeepers. We have over 5,000 registered beekeepers here in the state and together they produce about 10.7 million pounds of honey. That's a lot of honey every single year. So of those 5,000 registered beekeepers, only about 15% of these beekeepers are commercial beekeepers. Um, so that being said, um, the other ones are a lot of people who are just beekeeping in their backyard, doing as it a hobby and doing it for fun. Um, our commercial beekeepers might be those that are trying to produce honey, or it might be those that are specializing in bee removal. So a single hive can produce about 50 to 100 pounds of honey um, every year. So that's, that's quite a bit of honey right there. Um, and moving right along, we did have some questions about the challenges that bees are facing, and there's a lot that can go wrong with bees. Um, they can be impacted by pests and pathogens. Um, that being some of them. You can see pictures here of the varroa mite, and in this picture you can see um, deformed wing virus, which is something that's transmitted by the varroa mite. And so just like we get sick, bees can also get sick, and there's things that can get inside the hive and cause problems. And as a beekeeper, we go in and double check that everything's going on the way it should be and look for the signs, look for the symptoms that something isn't right. Also, we have pesticides that are a problem for our bees. And in recent years, they have added a bee box to our pesticide labels. Um, so our pesticides that could potentially affect bees now have this bee advisory warning that includes some special instructions for using these pesticides near bees or when pollinators are present in an area. Um, because our pesticides, they can affect our, some of our insects and bees are also insects. And so the pesticide doesn't just always target um, one insect, it can sometimes target other insects, including our beneficial insects like our pollinators. Uh, winter climates are another thing. Um, sometimes colonies do not do well throughout the winter, especially up in the north when it gets really, really cold. This is a problem for our colonies less so for us here in Florida because we have fairly mild winters. Um, and then poor nutrition. So in urban areas, this is a concern where there's not a lot of flowers and areas where bees can feed. Um, so limited foraging sources in that sense that if there's not a lot of flowers out and about, the bees aren't gonna be able to find nectar and find the pollen food sources that they do need. And so that leads us to the discussion of how can you help? So first and foremost, planting pollinator friendly garden or landscape plants. So things with lots of flowers, especially those kinds of plants that are high in um, nectar and rich um, pollen sources for the bees to survive. And we do have resources available that I will be sharing with everyone after the class today for selecting good pollinator plant plants to put in your garden and landscapes to help attract those pollinators as well as sustain the ones that are in the areas. Um, limit your use of pesticides, especially if there are pollinators out there and in the area. Just know that your pesticides could potentially affect our pollinators. You could also create bee habitats. Um, this is something for some of our other bees, not honeybees specifically, um, but these bee habitats give pollinators a good place to relax, to make their home, and to kind of stick around your area. So when they have a place to stay, they're happy and they'll continue to pollinate in the area. 
And then you can also become a beekeeper yourself. There is the ways to do beekeeping in small areas in your backyard. You don't have to be a commercial beekeeper either. A lot of our beekeepers are not commercial beekeepers. They just do it as a hobby and for fun. And then that also brings me to the point, buy local honey and related products because that does support beekeepers in your area so that you're bringing those pollinators and keeping some of our pollinators local to where you are. And for the farms in the area, this is also important to have those um, pollinators nearby. So we're at the end of our class here today, but we aren't quite done. We, I see we have a lot of questions here in the chat, but I do want to launch this poll real quick. Um, you should now see pop up onto your screen the question, after attending today's webinar, how do you rate your current level of knowledge on bees and beehives on a scale of one to five? So just quick, decide what you think. Did you learn something today with us? And we'll get into answering some of these questions in the chat here shortly. And you may recognize this question as this was a question that you were asked before today's class. And now we're asking you, what do you know now that you attended? I'll give it a couple more seconds here to make sure that uh, everyone can answer this. All right, go ahead and end our poll here for today. Thank you for participating. And I do want to mention some resources for you all when it comes to learning more about bees, but I do want to put a quick plug in here that we do have our virtual farm tours ongoing right now. I know it says it starts April 26th, but we ended up starting them a little bit early. So you can scan the box here, um, or you can always reach out to us or visit our Facebook page for more information on the virtual farm tour. We did tour with one of our local commercial beekeepers. So you can see a really cool video where we go inside some of his beehives at a local blueberry farm. And so that's just a quick plug on that. And I know we do have quite a few questions in the chat box um, on what can I do to learn more about beekeeping. So with UFIFAS extension in Orange County and UFIFAS extension in Seminole County, we do have some upcoming beekeeping classes. Um, so beekeeping 101 is beekeeping for me. Beekeeping 201, Beekeeping Basics, as well as we are having one of our very first in-person portions of our beekeeping classes coming up here shortly on May 8th. So really excited for that. It's the first time in a while we'll be able to have some kind of in-person programming. Um, but you can visit, visit the Orange County Extension um, Eventbrite for more information on signing up for these classes. Um, and I will be sending out a follow-up email to everyone so that you have these resources available um, and at your disposal, as well as a quick survey that we'll be asking. Um, so keep, keep a lookout for that email. We would really appreciate you filling out that survey. It helps us for reporting, as well as tell our bosses how we're doing. And it's really important for us. And also it asks for your feedback of what kind of classes you would like to see in the future. If you liked this virtual and kind of virtual tour of our hives and what more we can do in the future. All right. So with that, I will open it up to the rest of the questions that we have here. Um, I can see we have quite a few of them still left. So Katie and JK, do you see any of them that you are ready and wanting to answer right off the bat. Um, I see will neem oil harm bees and I think a lot of people think if they're going with organic pesticides that it's not going to be harmful to beneficial insects but that's not true. So it may be sublethal for bees but neem oil contains the active ingredient as a directin and that does lead to lower body weight uh, in bees whenever they get high levels of it. So if that gets fed to their brood and nectar or gets introduced to the hive, it can have bad effects on the hive to have that neem oil getting in there. And that's true for a lot of the botanicals. Um, they're still not good for our pollinators. So if you can 
avoid spraying when pollinators are active. That's the best thing you can do. Or use things that aren't actively having a chemical pesticide in them, something like a, an insecticidal soap or oil where it has to come in direct contact with the creature while it's still wet. Thanks, Katie. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah, so, uh I mean, I, I, I would just go down the list if you guys want to answer these questions. All righty. So we have a question here. After attempting a split with a snow grove board to retard swarming, I found evidence of a laying worker a couple weeks later. I rejoined the two, hoping this quick fix would stop the laying worker. What was this the best action? So... I don't exactly know what a snow grove board is myself, um, but uh, so if you got a laying worker, you're just getting drone breed because she that's all she can lay is just drones. And so when you combine them back together, she should pick up on that, that queen pheromone and you should be fine. You should be back to normal. Just you have some more drones coming out soon is all the difference you likely will have. Awesome, thanks JK. Yep. Um, Let's see, um, what is the wax made of? Uh, so the wax, um, it, it, it actually comes from a gland that the bees have on their on the underside of their abdomen. Uh, they actually have wax glands and as they consume energy sources, that's what they kind of put on their extra energy source. Kind of like if we put on fat, they put on, they secrete this wax from the underside of their abdomen. And so you can actually look at it sometimes when you look at bees, but they'll take that wax and that's what they'll use for their cappings. That's what they'll use to make the comb. That's what they, that's what they use. That's where the wax comes from. And it's made of like esters, um, hydrocarbons yeah. and a couple other things in there. But like JK said, that's something that the bee is making. Okay, and I think we already answered this question, but just to reiterate as organic gardeners, how can we help bees in our gardens? Um, really, it's just making sure that you have those pollen sources available um, and then having plants that the bees do like. There are some pollen sources that are better for bees than others. We won't get into that too much here today, but we do have some resources we'll send out after the class in regards to that. Any other comments? And having a wide variety of uh, different plants that are blooming at different times. So if you have a garden that's only blooming one time of year, it's only useful to the bees one time of year, as opposed to having an extended blooming season with a lot of different plants. Oh, that's okay. I'm glad you did that. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, can a, a hive ever have multiple queens like ants can? So yeah, it is possible. It's not all too common, especially within our beekeeping and our Langstroth style hives. It's it's all pretty, it's all pretty small. So that actually they could they would find each other and have a duel to the death more or less. But it is possible in some situations, especially in really really large hives, to have multiple queens on the, in there, and have their own kind of areas where they do their own thing. But so it is possible, just not very common. Thanks, JK. Um, let's see here. Um, we already addressed why honeybees are considered livestock, but is that why you now need a veterinarian in intervention to treat with teramycin for foul brood? Um, it's, it's kind of a chicken before the egg situation here. So it's not the exact reason. The reason why that is, is the VFD, the veterinary feed directive, which I can't remember when they passed it, but they actually started enforcing it in about 2017 to where any uh, antibiotics for animals must be prescription-based written from a veterinarian. So you can't just get over-the-counter kind of stuff anymore. And that's that's exactly why. That's a, that's a uh, antibacterial uh, application. And so we got to go through a veterinarian to be able to get that product because bees are livestock. So yes and yes, I guess is the answer to the question. A great answer to that question. Um, already answered about gardening. Um, and then another question, just to reiterate, do you have any suggestions on more education? Um, we have those upcoming beekeeping classes if this is something that you're interested in. Um, and then you also mentioned the UF Master Beekeeping Program. Is this something that you would suggest? Yeah, I, I I'm actually going through the Master Beekeeper program right now, um, and it's I love it. it. It's a really great program. Dr. Jamie Ellis and, and Amy they they've made it very simple, 
it's based off modules, every little topic, they have a great presentation that's narrated to you and they have a quiz afterwards. It goes into detail about stuff that you may not have thought of beforehand. And it's, yeah, it's a really great program. Uh, anything, another thing that I would suggest is joining your local beat club if you can, because that's a great, great source of information as well, but also resources. Yeah, and here in Seminole County, they do kind of have like a mentorship program with our local beekeeping um, club so that you can kind of, if you're interested in starting a hive yourself, you can work with a more experienced beekeeper to get that experience to be able to do it yourself. And it's it, there's a good chance that there are local chapters of the beekeeping clubs that are also um, doing something similar. Um, is there any organic approved repellent to prevent wild bees from forming a hive in a structure on your property that won't harm the bees? So without getting on my organic soapbox, uh, I will say that the uh, uh, butyric acid is something that you see commonly in uh, a lot of our bee repellents, uh, the bee bandit, what, you know, Sometimes we'll play, uh, spray that to get the bees out of the honey super so we can just take the honey super off. They hate the smell of it. And, and frankly, it's not good. It doesn't smell good to us either. It smells like uh -oh. uh, kind of rotted <laughs> butter. And uh, so butyric acid, which is organic, it, at least chemically speaking, it's organic. I don't know whether it's been approved by uh, organic board or not, but chemically speaking, it's, it's organic. And so you can spray that and the bees won't go near it. Now it does have a time effect. It, just you know, If you were gonna to try to spray something to prevent bees from going in that spot for the whole year. I don't know if exactly that's the route. You might have to spray frequently to try to get rid of it. Um, but butyric acid is usually the way to go. Best thing you can do if you're worried about bees getting into an in structure is to perform some exclusion activities. So make sure you're sealing up any holes that they could get into. Uh, make sure that there isn't an entry point for them in the first place. And whenever we're worried about any bugs getting into our house exclusion is your first step making sure that there's not an entry point for them in the first place and i know we had some questions in the registration what do we do if there are bees in a structure that they should not be in um, there are services out there that are bee removal services or it's possible that a local beekeeper might be interested in removing those bees um, it's, it's kind of hard to say, and we can't, though we can't recommend any specific services, we can just tell you that they are out there. They, they do exist, and some of them do remove the bees and relocate them, and some of them do not. But you would have to talk with that bee, um, that bee removal service specifically to understand what their specific practices are. Yeah, the, the, at least here in Florida, the State Department of Ag actually has a list on their website of certified bee removal and eradicators in, broken down by county. And so you can actually go to that Excel sheet online and or you can contact us and we can send it to you. And you can actually find people locally by doing that as well. Mm -hmm. And um, Katie, are neonicotinoid pesticides a no-no? Uh, if you are trying to grow a pollinator garden and making sure that your bees are happy, you probably shouldn't be using neonics in that garden. Uh, if you're dealing with like a shrub that doesn't bloom or we're between blooming seasons for it and days till it bloom is, is going to be by the time the neonic runs out of the plant, you'd be okay with it. But for home gardeners in particular, there are so many other products that you could use that I would use those first where possible. Uh, and I saw we had another question about what was the product that you could use instead of neem oil. Um, something like horticultural oil or insecticidal soap would both be good to use in your garden as opposed to neem, which has that as a directin in it. So the way the horticultural oil works is it gets onto the surface of the insect uh, when you spray it. So when you're first spraying it, it gets onto the surface of the aphid or the scale insects or the mealybugs that you're trying to treat for and it makes it so that they can't actually breathe in through their sphericals on the side of their body, so it suffocates them. And once it's dry, it's inactivated, so it's no longer going to be hurting any insects that come into contact with it once it dries. Uh, with the soaps, it actually washes off the waxy cuticle on the outside of their body, so they desiccate. And again, once that soap has dried down, it doesn't actually have any effect on anything that comes into contact with it afterward. And you can find both of those for sale anywhere that has a garden center. You can order them online. They're pretty easy to find. So it would be either horticultural oil or insecticidal soap is what they're sold as. Maybe. 
Um, and we do have some like housekeeping questions here as well. Um, what were we using to video today? So we were actually using an iPad and um, we had a Wi-Fi router set up out in our beekeeping area um, so that we were able to run Wi-Fi to the iPad and have hopefully a clear image. I'm hoping that's what you all saw. And um, yeah, just pretty simple using microphones connected to that iPad to, to try to get some clear sound and hopefully it worked out the way it was supposed to. Um, and uh, another question here, how can you find the recorded webinar? I mentioned at the beginning of class today that we were recording. So if you are interested in re-watching or sharing with friends, um, I will be sending a link to that recording through email to everyone that participated today. And we'll also share it on our social media pages as well. So if you like us on Facebook um, or YouTube, we do have a, a account on YouTube as well. You can follow all the videos that we are posting. Right, and then we have one more question here. I've seen a cinnamon scented organic approved pesticide. Don't know the name of it. Used at a local community garden store that has had a devastating effect on local bee populations, but they stopped using that product after. Um, do we have any comments on this product? Uh, I know at the nursery I worked at before here, we had something that I, again, I don't know what the product was, but it was an organic oil blend that was cinnamon and cloves and I think thyme oil all together. And uh, they used it right at the beginning of summertime and it burned the heck out of our tomatoes. So with those oil sprays, you do need to be careful with uh, the, heat, the heat index of the day as well, because sometimes they can just completely cook plants if we're hot out. And the same actually goes for our horticultural oil or neem oil. Um, a lot of times those labels will have temperature ranges that you should be using those at. And if we're getting into our summertime where we're 90 to 100 degrees, you shouldn't be spraying them during the day. All right. So I think we've caught up with all the questions we had in the Q&A. Um, I thank you all for joining us today. I did post into the chat. So you probably got a notification that your chat box had a message. Um, the link to the survey for today that I mentioned, um, give us some feedback, what we can do to improve on, um, how well we did teaching some concepts and stuff like that. Um, we really appreciate you filling out this survey, but if you are unable to take it right now, like I said, I'll be sending a follow up email here shortly with access to the survey, access to the recording, as well as some good resources um, based on some of the questions that we had today. And thank you for joining us. And thanks, uh, Katie and JK, for helping out. This was the first time we did something with a live component like this. And I think it turned out pretty well. But I hope that you all enjoyed it, too. OK. Yep, definitely enjoyed it. Thanks. All right. We're going to sign off for today. Thank you all again for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your Friday and enjoy your weekend. <laughs>